Hey, how you doing? This is RJ. So today, I'm going to focus on something a little more positive. I usually try to do a positive video every once in a while instead of focusing on the negative all the time. And the positive that I want to look at today is the future of entertainment after we have gotten rid of this quote-unquote progressive entertainment that we see everywhere today. And I truly believe that this progressive entertainment is going to collapse. Now, I'm not going to focus on the how it is going to collapse, but more the why it is going to collapse and see what happens after that. And I'm not just going to give my opinion. I'm going to try, as I always do, to look at this logically, to look at the history of entertainment and use history as it is logically supposed to be used, which is to say you look at what is past, you try to pick out patterns of human behavior within that history according to first principles, and then bring that forward to the future to see if you can understand and what is going to happen. But before I get there, and somewhat related, I just want to let everyone know that the early bird sign-up page for my new graphic novel is still up. The link for it is in the description and on the pinned comment at the top. My new graphic novel is called The Valiant Heroes, number one. It is an 82-page spectacular graphic novel of plain old superhero suspense, epic storytelling, and fun. If you go over to the Early Bird sign-up page and leave your email address, you will be informed when the project goes live, and if you then order something from the campaign, you will get a free, exclusive pin-up poster that you can only get through signing up early with your order. And it looks like we're almost ready to go. We may be shutting down this early bird sign-up page within the next week. So if you want that free exclusive pin-up poster with your order and you still haven't signed up, you should do so fairly quickly. All of my artists are working furiously on their part of this project because I have various artists working on this one. We're trying to get it out quicker than the last one by having more artists work on the book with the different stories within it. The main artists are Renzo Rodriguez, Martin Stevenson, and Mike Gustavich. And you're looking at some of their art in the background, and if that looks appealing to you at all, you might want to go over and leave your email address so you will be informed when this project goes live. But back to my topic. So, in order to talk about the entertainment industry and its future, I'm going to look at one very specific industry, and that would be the comic book industry, and talk a little bit about its history to begin with. And I'm doing that for several reasons. Number one, because a lot of the television and the movies that you see around you today are being produced because they were comic book stories. So comic books and the industry itself have become intricately entwined at this point with many other forms of entertainment. Number two, because the comic book industry was one of the first industries to go whole hog into this quote-unquote progressive woke agenda with the production of its product. I've done videos about this, which I'll link in the description as well if you've never heard them. But quite literally, I think if I remember correctly, it was in 2009 that Joe Quesada approached Sana Amanat and said, we want you to revamp the entire way that our stories are told, the entire way that comics are produced, and how this entertainment system actually works. Now, comics were not the first to do this. I would say the publishing industry as a whole, publishing for novels, mostly fiction novels, were the first to do this in almost, I would say, about 2002. But comics were a close second. The number three reason why I want to focus on the comic industry is because this woke agenda that has taken over the comic industry is still going full bore within that industry. Whereas you see very small little hints within television and movies and other entertainment that they might be turning around, the comic book industry is still going full steam ahead over the destructive cliff of woke entertainment. And the last reason is the reason I usually focus on this industry. It's because it's a very easily identifiable, self-contained industry where you can see the strains of exactly what is going on if you look hard enough. There's just too much going on in, let's say, Hollywood and the movie industry or the television industry to really see those strains of activity well enough to understand what's going on. So I won't bury the lead. What do I see as being the thing that made comics great to begin with in its history? And I would say it can be summed up in one word, although I'm going to use this word in various ways. And that word is continuity. Now, to delve a little bit into the history of comics, what I want to look at and focus on is why DC Comics became the big publisher and why Marvel Comics eventually 
took over that place from DC Comics? And what was the reason why they became so great within the industry so that they were number one at their respective times? Because when DC Comics was originally publishing, or its forerunners were publishing, they were publishing in a time where there were a lot of different comic publishers. But DC eventually got to be the one that was on top. Why? Now, I know there are very many reasons for why, but I'm going to focus on what I think is the driving force behind many of those reasons, and it wasn't just chance. And that is because they had a kind of continuity that allowed for their storytelling to be recognizable and acceptable. Now, I'm sure many of you are thinking to yourself, I've read old DC Comics, there's no continuity in them whatsoever. They were specifically made in a way that didn't have continuity. Well, that's continuity of story. No, they did not have continuity of story. You could pick up a Superman comic no matter where it was, when it was, pre-crises, which was 1985, and it didn't matter if you had read another Superman comic ever before in your life. Why? Because they didn't have story continuity. It was a self-contained story that did not have any connection whatsoever to any old stories. But the thing that they did have, the continuity that DC Comics did have, was a continuity of message. This was something that developed over its publishing history, and it is the process of finding the best way of actually making those comics, which ones sold, listening to their audience, and then focusing on those. And in then, focusing on one particular kind of comics, they gave their stories a continuity of message. And that continuity of message was that they basically gave you a superhero story that was the equivalent of a Norman Rockwell painting. It was American iconography that tapped into how America saw themselves. It was a self-contained story that dealt with the limitations of the publishing industry and the reading comprehension level of people at that time, and a whole lot of other factors that actually played out within the history of America itself. But honestly, I think the best way, the simplest way to describe it is they presented superhero stories as a Norman Rockwell painting. They tapped into the American spirit and reflected back to the people what they wanted to see, what they were hungry to see, and that was their continuity of message. And we can see this within the history of DC. They had several lines at one point, but where did the superhero line emerge from? Where did they get Wonder Woman? Where did they get Flash? Where did they get Green Lantern? It came from their line of all American comics. And this continuity of message was something as I said, which emerged from who America was at that time and what the people wanted, or more specifically, how the people wanted to see themselves. And it was simplistic, and some might even say hokey, but again, if you look at America at that time, a lot of people might look back at the 40s and 50s and some of the 60s and say, yeah, it was kind of simplistic and hokey in the way that they saw themselves. But again, it is that continuity of message that allowed them to become the big boy on the block. And funny enough, it was their inability to continue with that continuity of message that gave their competition, Marvel Comics, the ability to take over from them. There's a story that Jim Shooter talks about when he was working for DC Comics, because he worked for DC Comics for a long time. He started when he was, what, 16, maybe even younger. And he was pretty much a veteran by the time that Marvel Comics came along. And he saw that Marvel Comics was taking over because they had a different kind of continuity. It was a continuity of story. And he says he went to his editor at that time and said, we should do this with our comics. And the editors at DC told him, that's not what we do here. Although Jim Shooter then recalls that he went and did it anyways in the book that he was writing for at that time, which was Superboy and the Legion of Superheroes. And his editors just looked at him out of the side of their eyes and said, yeah, whatever, you're working on a nothing book anyways, we'll ignore you. And the reason why I focus a little bit on that story is because Jim Shooter then moved on to Marvel Comics and became the editor-in-chief of Marvel Comics, and he was the one who brought that business into it is doing extremely well to it is an extremely well-oiled machine. And the thing being that the continuity for Marvel Comics was more than just a continuity of story. The continuity of story was merely a byproduct 
of the continuity of message that Marvel Comics had tapped into within changes within the psyche of America. Because at the time that Marvel Comics was becoming a great comic publisher, within the 60s and the 70s, there was a radical shift within how America saw itself. No longer could you convince the entire nation that everything was a Norman Rockwell painting. And it was because of this doubt of who America was and what America was becoming, and the questions that emerged from that, that destroyed, to some extent, the continuity of message of the heroic American individual and all that underlies that iconography. That all changed within those two decades. And the people at Marvel, the people creating comics for Marvel, saw that, moved with that, and began their continuity of story, which reflected more of what, as their tagline goes, is the world outside your window. Again, as Jim Shooter once put it, all Marvel had to do was become 10% more realistic than DC Comics, and that was their foothold on beating out DC Comics. So entertainment in this form went from a photorealistic picture, which was a Norman Rockwell kind of picture, to an actual photograph of what is going on around within the country. The difference being, of course, that you can't stage, or it's much more difficult to stage, all that goes into the picture when you can't start from scratch and do photorealism, and you just have to take a photograph. This is why Marvel became the nitty-gritty comic company. This is why Marvel was able to reflect what was going on within the nation. This is why Marvel was able to present the new continuity of idea that was flowing through the nation at that time, and then harness that by having a continuity of story, which again allowed for a better reflection on what was going on and the questions being asked. And I'll have to stick this in there, and I know that a lot of people hate when I do this, but yes, the Comic Code did play a major part in both of those companies becoming who they became. Why? Because it always allowed for a certain kind, an external source, continuity of the kind of stories being told and how they were told. Honestly, for myself, as a businessman, when I had created my business, whenever I ran across something which was a hindrance to me, I always looked at it in a positive light and said, how can I flip this around in order to make it work to my advantage? And I honestly believe that especially Marvel Comics and Stan Lee at Marvel Comics looked at the Comic Code Authority and said, hmm, how can I use this to my advantage? And he did spectacularly use that to his advantage because there was something which played into the continuity of a story within the universe, which was a continuity of the kind of stories being told, which again ties right back into that continuity of message of the questioning of the American nation at that time by its own citizens. And so there wasn't any kind of story being told that was an outlier. There wasn't any separate titles, separate kind of titles being told that would counter that message, which was very much an undercurrent, an underlying message of everything is being told in the same kind of way. Or to put it another way, everything is pulling in one direction. Which again, you can agree or not agree with the merit of the Comic Code Authority and how it affected comics. But again, a good businessman, and I would say Stan Lee was certainly a good businessman, any good businessman takes restrictions that are placed upon him and says, how can I use this to my advantage? Now, I could go on and on about the history of Marvel and DC Comics and talk about specific events, why this continuity eventually became corrupted and then discarded. I actually just did, and then went back and deleted it all, about 45 minutes of it, because it would make this video way too long. Anyways, I'm going to go over it very briefly, and just say that you'll see from a point of about 1985 forward, you start to see a corruption of this continuity. Now, first within DC, you see the crises on Infinite Earths, where they began to embrace the idea of a continuity of story, thinking that that would lead them back towards being on top. And it did give them some advantage at that time, 
but then they took the unfortunate step of saying, yeah, see, we got an uptick within a rebooting of our continuity of story. Let's do it again. That was about 1995 with Zero Hour. And then they did it again, and then they did it again, and then they did it again. And they just kept on taking out their own legs every time they rebooted their own line, because in trying to reestablish the continuity of their story, they just destroyed any continuity of their story. And this fed backwards once again to a destruction of the continuity of idea that they were focusing on, which was a Norman Rockwell kind of painting of the heroic American individual. You'll notice that as they continued to reboot their line, they tried to get more and more nitty-gritty, moving more and more away from what made them great to begin with, and just plunging them more and more into irrelevance. You'll see the same thing with Marvel Comics in a different way. For Marvel Comics, it was a disregarding of the Comic Code Authority. First publishing, I think it was Marvel Fanfare, just one title outside of that authority, if I remember correctly. And then after that, moving into different imprints like the Epic imprint and so on and so forth. Which, once again, as I said, whereas within those other stories and within that other time Everything was pulling in one direction. Now you had a diffusion of forces pushing this company into different directions. And with that, there was a dilution of their continuity of message and how that played out within their stories. And I do not think it is a coincidence at all that when Marvel Comics eventually got rid of the Comics Code Authority altogether, which, if I remember correctly, was around 2001, this is when you began to see the emergence of this quote-unquote progressive woke entertainment, although I would say it started at the very least around 1995 to infiltrate their company. You saw these people begin to take over and then insert their own message within to what you saw as being entertainment. Now, here's where I break off and talk about something which seemingly is entirely separate. It is anime and manga and how they are just trouncing American comic books right now. But this ties in very much as a different vantage point looking at the same problem of where this entertainment industry went and where it's going to go in the future. So the thing being that right now, since Japanese comics, manga are doing so well, a lot of people think that we should imitate within North America how they produce their comics and what kinds of stories they tell, and that will be the future of American comics. I would say no, not at all. Why? Because this form of storytelling does not fit with America. Because here's the thing, even though as I said, manga is doing extremely well, it will continue to do extremely well, and it will be a dominating factor within the comic book market for a number of years to come, I have no doubt, until a new Stan Lee emerges. And, again, I have no doubt that a new Stan Lee will emerge and tell stories in an American way. And that's the whole point. Manga is told in a very good way, they do it very efficiently, but it's not told in an American way, or even, I would say, in a European way. Why? Because they lack that kind of continuity of message. Because here's the thing. Within Japanese culture, you have a plethora of competing ideas that exist together side by side, and their culture is quite fine with those seemingly and practically contradictory ideas existing next to each other without any kind of friction. This is a product of their history. This is a product of their geography as an island. This is a product of their mindset and how they had to, and still have to, survive as an island nation. And that allows for a kind of storytelling where you have multiple viewpoints and multiple kinds of stories and multiple continuities starting and ending over and over again with new stories and new kinds of stories which aren't tied together. All of this can happen over and over again and they can do well and sell well and have an extremely good market for it. But that's not the way Americans think. And that's not the way Europeans think. And that's why I say, sure, we'll use it for now, because it has more merit to it than American comics, 
But as soon as an American thinking comic company or entertainment company that produces comics for some other reason is going to come along, a new Stan Lee is going to come along with a continuity of message and product, then it's going to move back towards that. Because what you have within manga and anime and the Japanese storytelling as a whole right now, which again, I admit, is dominating certainly within the comic market, what you have is this loose-knit short story form which we did see within, I would say, the late 1800s, early 1900s with pulp fiction and the emergence of short stories within pulps and all that kind of thing. And yes, they did spectacularly well in the place and time that they were in. But no one really talks about those things anymore. And I think really the greatest example of this would be the very first Twilight Zone show. This, as a form of entertainment, most people would say is extremely well-produced, they have extremely well-acted, well-photographed, well-thought-out stories that can tie into the lives of people of any time. Many people would consider that an apex of science fiction. And yet, nobody talks about the old Twilight Zone stories anymore. Or if they do, it's just a niche thing that a couple of people will probably watch. No one cares. Why? because there is not that continuity there that allows them to tie into not just entertainment, but the history of the nation that brings us all the way forward to now. And that's what manga and anime are probably going to become. Within 25, 40 years from now, people are going to look back at it and think of it as a curiosity that had its time. And the reason for all of this, the reason why American and European culture will not focus on that fragmented kind of storytelling is because of the thing I've been talking about for a long time on my channel. It is the fact that European culture, for at the very minimum 2,400 years now, has a meta-narrative. They have focused on a meta-narrative, and not just a meta-narrative, but a meta-narrative of truth. This is what has made America great. This is what has made European civilization great. We looked at all the things around us from the time of the ancient Greeks and said, hey, look at this society over there. They have something which has some merit to it. Let's adopt that thing from over there Pick out the truth of what works from it because we're focused on a meta narrative of truth. We will discard what doesn't work and will absorb it into us and we will become greater. This is why, throughout European civilization, you see the same thing over and over again. You see the Greeks adopting all of these things from the nations around them, incorporating them into their own society, and becoming great. This is why European civilization can do something like absorb Arabic numerals and make them the de facto counting system that we use because it's more efficient we're just going to take that and use it for ourselves and incorporate it into what we use and go to a further extent than anybody has ever used it before. That's why the English language is the way that it is, because it's just a cobbled together hodgepodge of a whole bunch of different languages taking what we see as the most efficient and best way to use this type of language and that type of language and just throw it all together. We don't care if it's a cobbled together mess as long as it serves the narrative of efficiency, and that efficiency is calculated through its rational and logical performance, which depends upon a meta-narrative of there is one truth and we will pursue it. So I could be flip and say, yeah, see, I lived through the 1980s where we were all told that look at the Japanese economy, how it is growing exponentially. They're going to take over the world and America is going to be Japanese in 20 years and then watch that just completely fall apart. The exact same thing is happening right now, except it's not in an economic sense, it's in a cultural sense. Everyone's saying, yeah, see, all these cultural things, the merit of these stories, and I do admit, they do have some kind of merit, certainly compared to what you see being produced within North America right now, and they're saying, it's going to take over everything. No, it's not. 
Again, I could just reference that simple crash that happened in the 1980s and say, I've lived through this before, it's not going to happen, but I don't want to just be anecdotal. The point is, to go back to first principles, Americans and Europeans don't think that way. We think in a way where there is a meta narrative dependent upon truth. If you have a whole bunch of systems which have contradictory ideas at the same time working against each other, we don't sit back and go, yeah, we'll just let it be. It's no, they're going to fight it out to the death until one of them is left standing. And why did I go into that seemingly long sidetrack? It's because you see the exact same thing within the progressive system right now. Except they're not saying we're going to have a bunch of different narratives that are going to control just like we have within a Japanese kind of system. No, they have continued with the European model to say there's one meta narrative, except that meta narrative is what we claim to be true. And that's the funny thing about all of these strains of thinking, which I have studied in depth within my degrees. Again, what I study was the history of ideas. If you look at all these ideas which challenge the norms of Western civilization, if you look at Nietzsche, if you look at Freud, if you look at Marx, if you look at these progressive people right now, all of their ideas would not be able to exist without that European focus on the meta narrative of truth. All those individuals and their systems of thinking did was to take some part of Western civilization and they would flip it over in order for them to say, you see, there's still a meta narrative, it's just not dependent upon truth. Or to put it another way, in the terms that I've been talking about in this video, they've been saying, Yes, we're going to continue with this continuity of Western civilization while tearing out its heart, while taking out the exact thing which allows it to move forward and connect with people. And this is what we saw within the history of the comic industry moving forward. Within the 1990s, you saw these people who were typically from each of the American coasts, who lived in cities their entire lives, who didn't know anything about middle America, who were in this progressive bubble, and they thought, everybody's like me. Therefore, we're going to create entertainment for people who are just like me. This fed into the chat boards of the early 2000s, where again, they started to make these bubbles of entertainment and people who could discuss this entertainment by banning and getting rid of anyone who would discuss things outside of this progressive norm. And those people eventually worked their way into the comic book system. And then at the same time, we had the emergence of social media, where you had these exact same people who were working within this comic book system and who were coming up within this system, placing themselves within a silo an echo chamber of their own ideas of progressivism. And in so doing, they still understood and still accepted and still ran with the idea that we need to have a continuity of message within our entertainment. And they still understood that in some way, that continuity of message needs to reflect what the people who consume this entertainment or will consume this entertainment, how they see themselves, but since more and more of the people who were producing the entertainment only saw one side of the story, which was the progressive side of the story, and believed that everyone was like them, or at the very least that the future was like them, they believed that the meta narrative of the story should be nothing but progressivism. And so they look back at the history of comics and say, yeah, there was this meta narrative that everyone assumed was true back in the 40s and the 50s. And it was expressed within the superheroes of that time. And then it began to be questioned within the 60s and 70s. And those questions led to a more nitty gritty realism within Marvel Comics. And that nitty gritty realism led into the 1990s and 2000s, where in their estimation, the majority of the nation moved on from that questioning of what America was to an understanding that America was inherently evil and then began in subtle ways to dismantle all of those evil institutions that made America what it was. 
They're continuing on within the same ideas that made DC great, that made Marvel great, within this continuity of ideas and how that was a reflection of how the American nation saw itself. It's just that the people who run these companies and who write these stories are so cut off from the typical way that an American or a North American or a European think that they truly believe that progressivism is the underlying message that everyone believes as part of the meta-narrative that they want to see reflected in their entertainment. And again, it's all predicated on their misunderstanding of the fact that they believe that Americans and Europeans simply crave a meta-narrative when that's not the case. Europeans and Americans don't just crave a meta-narrative, they crave a meta-narrative based on truth. And this is at the heart of the cry of, I want some kind of merit. Where does merit come from? Merit comes from allowing ideas to compete within each other to see which one comes out on top. That system of conflict can only exist where you assume that there is a guiding truth to existence that allows one to do better within reality than the other that gives one of those ideas an advantage over the other because they interact with the truth of reality in a more efficient way, thus win the fight, thus have more merit, thus let's go with that. So why am I discussing all this if I want to look at the future of entertainment? Well, I'm doing it because most entertainment that you see in front of you is based upon a story. What is the logical and rational definition of a story? A story that is based on that pursuit of one truth that is the Western civilization way of telling a story? Well, it's usually defined in one of two ways. It's a representation of reality and a rhetorical argument. And of course, a representation of reality harkens back to that idea of truth because reality itself is an expression of what is, that is to say, what is true, and a rhetorical argument, if used correctly, is a logical kind of argument, and logic is based upon what? What is, which is to say, what is true. And what kind of entertainment are we talking about? Where are the majority of stories still going to come from for our entertainment? Well, it is America. And since we're talking about American-based stories, as I said, we're talking about stories that rally around a meta-narrative of truth. And if we look at the history of entertainment, using comics as our guide through that history, we see that the stories, based upon that meta-narrative of truth, work best when they express themselves through a representation of who America is. Or more precisely, showing Americans a reflection of themselves. And not just a reflection of themselves neutrally, but a reflection of themselves that they want to see. And I don't mean that in a subjective way. I mean that in, let's take the best parts of ourselves that exist, really, in truth, and concentrate on looking at that. When that kind of thing is reflected back from entertainment onto an American public, those stories do well. In the 40s and 50s, it was a reflection that was a Norman Rockwell kind of painting. That simple, amusing, light-hearted, and yet inspiring look at who America was. In the 60s and 70s, it became a question of, who are we? Are we really reflected in this Norman Rockwell kind of painting? Are there parts of us that should not be there? And became this more nitty-gritty kind of story. So it went from, let's look at the best parts of ourselves, to Let's also consider some parts of ourselves which aren't very nice to look at and make sure we take those into account. And then it moved into the 90s and the 2000s where you had these quote-unquote progressive people trying to take away that essential core of truth to the meta narrative of the American reflection and say to the audience, no, you're going to concentrate only on the negative parts of yourself. Only on the negative parts of America only on the negative parts of European civilization. Why? Because progressivism says they're evil and need to be destroyed. But the thing is, that's not a reflection of what is. 
That's not a reflection of reality. That's not a reflection of the truth. That's not a story, which is supposed to be a reflection of reality. And so for all of those reasons, America has rejected that kind of entertainment. And when that kind of entertainment eventually falls under the weight of its own lies, then the pendulum will swing back to let's look at what is good and true within ourselves. And for my part, I believe that that's going to be a reawakening, a rediscovery of the traditional idea of a hero. Not all at once. We're not going to go back to Norman Rockwell painting all at once. We're going to go backwards again to that nitty gritty kind of story. And why? Well, because this last generation and even the generation before them, because of the progressive untruths that have been fed to them over and over again, don't have the mental equipment, don't have the language necessary even to fundamentally understand a lot of those concepts. So we have to start with stories where, yes, you have heroes who are not icons, their foots slip, they have to work constantly. It becomes a struggle to be that hero. Because in exploring where things work and where things don't, not just assuming that your audience knows what's going on and how these things work will give them the ability to understand the language of heroism. And even if it's not heroism, it will be a language of positivity to see the better part of yourself again. And this is why I write my stories in the way that I do. This is why I have a graphic novel coming out called The Valiant Heroes. This is why all of my stories are tied together in one continuity. This is why they're not Superman-like heroes. They're the equivalent of Spider-Man or Daredevil. For each of them, their foot slips. They need to struggle. And that struggle is worth it. For the exact same reason that the struggle that we are now going through within our entertainment is worth it. Because story is important. It allows us to hold a mirror up to ourselves. And all we've really been allowed to see in various forms of entertainment over the last 20, 40, 60 years is a reflection through the funhouse mirror of progressivism. But once we get rid of that, we will finally be able once more to see the noble reflection of who we truly are. So, if I've given you anything new to think about, hit like, hit the shield in the lower right-hand corner of your screen to subscribe, and leave me a comment. Tell me what you think about all this. And don't forget, the link is in the description and on the pinned comment to the early bird sign-up page for my graphic novel, The Valiant Heroes. If my type of storytelling sounds appealing to you at all, you might want to go over and leave your email address so that you will be informed when my project goes live. All right, I'll leave it there. I'll see you later. Bye.